What's up, Moto Buddies? Mike here from Taco Moto Co. and Baja Taco Tours. I'm going to give you an update video on our 23 450 XCFW. This is a bike that's in our long term fleet that we've been working through uh, various ride modes. And the one that we just came out of was our Desert Minimalist trim, where we had it set up for uh, fast acting, fast action desert, single track, and uh, some racing. Uh, so just light and mean and fast. And right now it's come back from Baja. So we just did a multi-day Baja trip and we've got it set up with some extra guards, extra protections and, a f and the extra fuel in the big uh, 15 liter, 3.1 gallon, a Cherubis tank. So this is how we set it up for, uh, for Baja riding. And you can compare to the other video to see what's been added to it. And maybe I'll just point out those things as we do it. I wanna give you the update and give you uh, um, uh, some opinions and observations about it so far what what's been working incredibly well some of the things that we're going to change because we've had some issues with and we'll start up here I guess on the front tire and so looking at the suspension we've got our front line set up and so we switched forks from the last video and this is a set that's been hard anodized on the outside we've got DLC coating here on the lower fork tubes and then Ryan at Frontline has completely gone through it and absolutely customized all the internals. And that was set up specifically for our Baja riding. And that worked unbelievably well. SKF on the mud scrapers because it's super muddy down there in Baja right now with a lot of rains. Southern California and the Southwest. Uh, we knew we'd encounter some mud, so we wanted to make sure that we didn't get any packing up in the seals. <clears throat> and they work really well. We like those. We also noticed you, we've added graphics package this is our new kit this is called the lowrider and very inspired heavily borrowed from lowrider culture and art on some of those vehicles it's crazy good it's insane how good this looks and we used a sparkle finish on this so on the sunlight sitting down on the beach we had some time some some beach riding and that kit looked unbelievable we've got another finish coming soon another laminate and it's like an iridescent kind of i don't even know how to paint a word picture of it but the next version of this we're going to print it in that with that laminate and that that's it just changes colors and highlights in the sunlight really really rad so that's coming up next so the forks are great suspension is incredible just an absolute hovercraft over the the real rough terrain that we were in in baja we went from very uh, tight single track to wide open race pace double track and uh, the, the setup just is absolutely flawless incredible uh, then as far as the front tire goes that's just the stock that's a dunlop tire that came on the bike that's the mx uh, 33f it's a hard compound tire the both front and the rear are hard compound and uh, they worked okay not a great sand tire uh, in the rear and i didn't love it i have other tires that i like better but it does a great job. I was pleased with it. I didn't have any major complaints with it. Inside of those tires are moose balls, which are, are really uh, now that's kind of our go-to inflation system. And that works really, really well on the single track. That's not a great moose for long duration highway. We did some road and they did just fine, but long extended highway sections, you're gonna wanna look at the Michelin instead, but these have great feedback and feel and I like them a lot. They did just fine. Front rotor disc guard. We have the STR. We like those carbon fiber. Very trick looking and very effective. Let's see, Ruby R7 headlight. We've always had that in there and that just continues to perform exceptionally well. We threw hand flags on there. Those are the reflex racing. We like these because they have the little, well, I'll show you the, the front of the bike and show you the, the controls a little bit later. And then let me walk you over here. We've got the dual sport kit. This is the Takamoto dual sport kit. And we've added lighting so that we could do full street lighting on this. And that's what this harness right here is. And then this wire is the horn. And so I've got the horn routed down here so it sits on top of the engine case. So instead of putting it in front of the radiators, we threw it down there and that's what these, so the little one is the horn. This one here is for the dual sport kit. And then this is the stock harness. And this blue plate right here, is the wire management head end bracket that that organizes all of that radiator guards i think we added those since the last time we talked about this bike these are emperor and we always run these on all of our bikes where survivability matters because unlike brush guard 
air quote radiator guards. These legitimately fully cover the radiator. You can see what kind of protection you get with those. We don't run anything else. They come all the way up the sides. Those are thebomb.com. As far as the exhaust, we had a grave system on here, which is really kind of our preferred setup. And the reason we have the Yoshi, and we're gonna start running the Yoshi on this bike, and we needed to make an engine mount as, an, as a hanger because this, this engine hanger is not the same on the 500 as it is here on this 450. So the Yoshi, this bracket, this weld-on bracket is specifically positioned for the 500, 501 engine bracket, and that's different. So we had to custom make an engine bracket. This is 3D plastic, but we'll be going to the machine shop here very quickly with a prototype version. And then we're gonna run that and test that. And so we'll start running the Yoshi uh, full system on this 450. And as far as I know, we'll be the only 450 in the world with a Yoshi on it because Yoshi doesn't, and I understand their metric here, there's probably not gonna be a lot of sales that are gonna go to the 450. And the expense on their side of taking this bracket and customizing it just for that one model probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but we, our workaround is with the engine bracket. So with our custom engine bracket, you can then add a Yoshi to the bike. And I think, I think I'm gonna be excited at how it's gonna sound and how it's gonna perform with that setup on there. We added a recluse. I run a recluse on all of our Baja bikes. And primarily the reason is, is because it allows me to do a lot of trail braking. I, I, my riding style is very heavy on the rear brake. I will typically, uh, ride 80% rear brake over front brake and I do a lot of braking as with the rear as I come into a turn and then hard on the throttle into the once once into the turn hooked up into the turn and then off the brake and onto the gas and the recluse lets me stab the rear brake without ever having to worry about what I'm doing with the clutch it also is a, a ride saver or a, an energy saver when you're in very difficult terrain, hard enduro type situations. So there are uh, some strong advantages to the Recluse. There are a couple of disadvantages, mainly cost and a little bit of clutch feel. You do lose, if you are a feather rider, if you ride a lot of hard enduro, hard enduro and you are uh, very, uh, uh, use a lot of clutch to bleed off power, you absolutely can do that uh, with the Recluse. The downside is, is you do lose some of that feathery feel to the clutch. And I am not a, uh, I don't spend a lot of time feathering out like that. So my ride style, uh, it's not negatively impacted where if others may say it does for them. So it's a very personal choice. I like it. I'm a hundred percent fan. That's a, that's the CX model. And so because we are, we converted this bike to the Baja trim, we went ahead and I threw that in there, the Recluse CX. And then I think may have talked about the, the tank. So that's the 3.1 gallon, that's 15 liter tank. And need that when you're down in Mexico. Uh, I always had the skid plate. So a lot of this stuff was already there before, but the molecule continues to do a great job for us. We really like it. You can see some of these trim pieces, P3, and then we've got Polysport on the, the guards here. That's what this is. This is just a protector for the, the plastic kit. And then we have the polysport swing arm guards. And then when we do our wraps, we do full wrap over the entire coverage. So you just get more graphic space when you have that on there. So I think the advantage of having a swing arm guard is you protect your investment. So when you go to resale, uh, you protect resale value in your bike because you're not gonna scratch up the swing arm so much, but then you also have more space for graphics. So there's something to be said about that. Back here in the rear, we have a <clears throat> STR again we have a STR shark fin and I took a massive hit from a side rock so we were going up a really rocky rough uphill and the there was a a big rock obstacle on the left side it was sort of a narrow shoot the line I picked kind of had a narrow shoot through through some rocks and I hit on the left hand side hit a hard Rock, hit a big rock on the left, which bounced the, the back end of the bike over against the rock ledge on the right. And so it smashed into it. And so it took a big gouge out of it, but it did exactly what it was supposed to do. It protected the rotor, but the road, so let me, let me 
see if you can see it. I found a bar out in the desert and I straightened it. So it dented in the rotor. So what it did is put a ton of lateral force. The, the back end of the bike must have just hit with some extreme energy. I felt it obviously for sure. And so when it hit that, it pushed in, pushed into the rotor and put a dent into the rotor. And so I had to ride without any rear brake for quite a while because what it what that warp did is it pushed the pads open. So the pads were always gapped. So if you use the rear brake, you'd have to pump two or three times to close the gap and then get some bite on the rotor and then the pedal had had wobbled to it. So you might say, well, if I had a heavier duty, like a Bulletproof or an Enduro Engineering discard, then that would have prevented that. And I would agree. Uh, the, the heavier duty and bigger the rear discard, the more likelihood that the energy would have just been absorbed into the guard itself. And I have dented these in where it dents in. And in one instance, it dented just enough to touch the rotor and it did not impact the rotor. And then I was able to find something to bend it back out and it saved the rotor from getting dented. But my calculation is, is I would rather save the unsprung weight and ride a lighter shark fin, which is exactly what this is, why I choose this one. So this was a calculated decision that I make on my rear shark fins. And in the instance that something exactly like this happens, then I'm willing to take that risk because I know that I can find generally, and this is, the, I did, uh, it was a fence, a metal fence post thing out in the desert in Mexico. And I shoved it up in here and then I was able to bend this out. So towards the back end of the ride, I had what was, I, I got my rear brake back and then it worked very acceptably well, even though I had a little bit of brake pulsing. And so now I need to replace this rotor. I'm not gonna go ahead and go through the, the, the hassle of trying to straighten this thing out completely so that it's true again. I'm just gonna swap it out. I'm gonna put a new one on there. So yes, a heavier guard would have very likely prevented that. But there's a downside to heavy guard, and that is you have a lot of rear end unsprung weight, which you can feel. And so I choose to have the lightest unsprung setup as possible, which means I yield a little bit of disc protection from a lateral hit. And again, you've heard what I had to say about that. And so I will continue to make that calculation. I'm gonna get with John and I'm gonna get a new, and this is replaceable. So this little, this is like a wear piece right here, UHMW material. And so I'll just get a new one of those and throw that on there and that will solve and resolve the little gouge piece that I'm missing, throw a new rotor on there. And away I go again, continuing to use it and continuing to be very happy with it. Uh, back here is that rear tire. This is a stock rear tire that came on the bike and that's the AT81, yeah, AT81, it's a 110 size. I would have preferred a larger tire. I like a 120 size down in Baja and I would have gone with something a little softer. Again, this is a hard tire and it's a little skittish on the road. If you are a little heavy on the throttle, the, the rear end will kind of walk out and it is a little hard and you can feel that on loose bladed type roads, but very good hookup. I was quite pleased with it in intermediate type stuff. I thought it did a good job. I don't think I'll run it again. I have, I have tires that I, I like better in Baja. I like the Shinko 505, which is a probably my go-to all around Baja rear tire and run the moose balls in that as well. Here's a P3 racing. This is a carbon fiber uh, rear mud flap and it's taken some scratches where some rocks have just come up and hit it, but looks good, performs good, still doing great. Got the, the tidy tail, the Takamoto tidy tail back on there. And because this this turquoise, so this is something kind of cool. The, the Acherby's plastics are the sparkle plastics. There are sparkle, love it, man. There's sparkles embedded into the plastics themselves. And that's a motocross kit, motocross plastic set. And so they don't have the little screw-ons for the enduro bikes for like, uh, for, for a tail section. So as a workaround, I just drilled and it's ugly and kind of hokey. And I, 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 you know, it is what it is, but uh, I just threw, and these are bolts are too long, so whatever. The, but, it, but it got me through it now uh, having 
I did this a couple of nights before the trip and so I was in kind of a hurry, but with a little more time and due care, I would have used a, a flatter button head screw to secure that and shorter, obviously, and done a little cleaner job, but it, it, it got it done and it boogers up the plastics or the, the, the graphics here just a tiny bit. So I'd rate that at about a f four or five out of 10. I could have done a better job. And if you, that's basically what you need to do if you're running motocross tailpiece because you picked a color that, uh, that they don't have in the enduro type fender then you need to do something like this. And some guys, instead of using two, will just drill one and put a one in the center. And that's maybe what I'll end up doing for the next try. So on the rear end, got a Dirk Trix uh, Iron Man rear sprocket. That's a chromatic finish. Love that one. That's a 14, I think I'm running 1448 is the, yeah, 1448. So that's the gear ratio that I'm running. And that's, that's my favorite all around Baja gear ratio. I have a wheel weight, uh, well, here's the wheel weights, but I have a rim lock in there, so always run a rim lock in the rear. I don't run a rim lock in the front and always balance, I always balance my my wheels whenever I run a moose. I always do it anyway, but especially and specifically with the moose. Otherwise, you will have a hot spot here. The, the rim lock is heavy, and so the, the, the tire will continually pound at the heaviest spot, and that will create a hot spot on the moose. And then when, if it if it does fail uh, because of a hot spot, a speed spot, too much heat, it will begin almost always begin where the rim lock is, where it heavy, where it's heaviest. And so, if you balance it out, you avoid that. Kickstand, kickstand was a major fail. The stock kickstands are not great on KTM's, never have been, and mine failed in two ways. It cracked here, and so and I also lost the hardware. So pro tip and I neglected to do this. The first, one of the first things you may wanna consider doing on your stock kickstand is pull, so you can relieve this spring tension, pull it off of the hook here so the spring is not loaded, preloaded here onto the bolt, but remove that bolt and I would red lock tight that. Don't over tighten it, tighten it very carefully with red lock tight because that popped off I think on the second day. And then the workaround is you just hold your kickstand here but then at some point in the trip, the bike on the beach sunk in the sand and then fell over. And when I went to pick it up, the stand, I noticed two things that that was gone. And then the stand had bent, it's, so it's bent in. It's kind of, it's cracked here, so it's, it's forced in. And now it's rubbing on my swing arm and it jacked up the graphics, which is bummer that. And so I'm gonna replace out this kickstand with a swift kicker stand. And that is right now my favorite stand and that has adjustability. So next time you see this bike, it'll have that on there. While we're here, we'll look at the, these are the uh, uh, the Evo Air extenders. These are by Promoto Billet and these are probably my favorite uh, pegs right now. Super wide on the footbed. And then this ankle saver is for your ankle. If you ever get in a situation where you're, you're heavy, you're hanging, you're like on the balls of your feet or the toes, and then you've got a lot of your body weight hanging off the back ankle. Your ankles are very vulnerable to being thrust down in a like a G-out situation. And so this little tab right here will prevent that. The, the heel of your boot will typically catch that and almost give you sort of a flat, the boot rest, the, the heel of the boot resting here almost allows your foot to be in sort of a flat position. These are adjustable. You can run them either forward or backwards and get a little bit of, get a, so a little lower or higher position. And then there's a little cam on the bottom that you can shim. And so you can preset the deck height or the deck angle rather, that would be extreme, but you get the idea you can set that and adjust that. So these offer some nice custom customization. You can also change this, the height of these pins here, these little Allen pins, and you can have short ones and long ones in the middle. You can experiment if you have a particular setup that you like, you can do all that and that's very cool. So that's that's a great foot peg. On the sprocket here, we threw a Dirt Tricks dome washer. That's kind of a must do on all our bikes. Inside of the air filter, we have a PC Racing filter base gasket and then the Twin Air with the Twin Air oil and then a PC Racing uh, 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 skin, filter skin filter skin over the top of the filter. So there's two, two PC racing 
products going on in there. Still run on the Golan. We've got the CPC brass connector and then the Taco Moto 90 degree fuel outlet on the bottom. Very protected. The, the 15 liter Cherubis tank has this nice little wing that comes down and that protects all this from side damage. And we've got our Taco Moto Sidewinder hose to just make sure that's all snug back up in there. There's the horn again. We talked about that. I don't think there's anything going on Additionally, you can see the P3 guard here. That's on that side. We're running the Taco Moto. This is our magnetic oil filter. And we've been doing some long-term oil testing with Travis from On Any Sunday. If you watch his YouTube channel or his Instagram, he's got a video coming out. We've been oil testing and oil uh, using oil lab results. And we're seeing that uh, uh, oil testing results come back showing about 50 hours of service life on oil for dual, dual sport use up to 80. So anywhere between 50 to 80 hours. And I'm running a high-end group five ester base oil, uh, something like a Maxima Pro Plus or a Modal 7100, anything in that ultra high-end category with a premium filter like that, running really clean air filters. So the real key to getting 50 to 80 hours of service life out of your engine oil are those things you have to have a you have to be very effective with your air cleaning and that was so we talked about that you need a very high-end group 5 ester based oil and then um and then our with our magnet that's the kind of oil duration oil cycle so i'm running 50 hours of oil changes on this bike and oil testing is very uh, bearing out that that's absolutely fine so that is pretty exciting uh let's see anything else on the side to really talk about we're running the takamoto fork wrap turn signals that's part of the dual sport package kit with the seat off we can see that we've got a takamoto starting capacitor that we've got down here on the side panel and that's because the enduro bikes don't come with a starting capacitor unlike the motocross bikes do and so that is a fail safe for extra protection if you have a battery issue uh, get ECU so we have a full tune set for this new bike and it is an absolute ripper unbelievable especially in the enduro mode with some traction tr control on and up here you can see we've got the this is the motocross version of the GPA module this displays launch control traction control and um, y y I've got that on there that's not very popular with the with the enduro guys because really it doesn't get you a whole lot if you're not using launch control. Launch control is really the key function you, with this device is adding that, being able to access that and then see which, which uh, traction control or launch control mode you're in and then to visually see which traction control mode you're in. So the motocross guys will use that right now. In 2023, Honda Factory Racing is using Get ECUs and Get products on their Supercross bikes and you'll see on the honda front fenders you'll see this little device and that's what's going on there and then they've got a mode button here which is this which then they can toggle through those modes and those settings and so honda racing for 2023 and right now you've got jet lawrence and chad sexton winning races in fact they've never not been on the podium and jet has won uh two races the first two chad just won last weekend so they're doing incredibly well dan truman with Athena is kicking some booty out there, and those guys are lighting the world on fire, and they're running the Getty CU system, which we've been running for years now. So people are beginning to see that the Getty CU is, uh, without exception, really the, the premier ECU product in the world right now, and uh, the results are showing it. And that's what we run, that's what we use, that's what we tune to, and that's what we have our success with on our bikes. Uh, and then I've just thrown the map switch doing a lot of, uh, so I've got, I've got all the gear on, all the get equipment on this bike, but that's just because this is sort of a test platform. And I, for whatever reason, threw it here out of laziness. Ideally, I would have put that on the bars. So the stock map switch, traction control switch, is not doing anything. I just left it on the bars, again, laziness. The ECU, uh, the get is ignoring that. So the get is to, to, to toggle between maps, you use the map switch here. This is and map. if uh, because I'm running this, which is telling me traction control mode, and I'm toggling through here, the more the simpler way, the more streamlined way is to just to have the dial, the dial, 
and then I like to mount it right here underneath the, the, the bolt here, and then it's at my right hand thumb, which I can then go ahead and then uh, dial that through. So this is really probably the more preferred setup for Enduro guys because, and you have visual indication of which which uh, traction control mode you're in, which setting you're in. So this is a little more, you can do both. Not at the same time, it's, it's you don't, you wouldn't run both of these at the same time, uh, but you could do one or the other. I'm just running this one because uh, I've just been doing some testing and experimenting, but when I'm done, I will probably pull this off and then I'll just be running this like I do on all of my standard bikes. But that's just kind of a, an overview of that Getty CU system and what some of those features and then input devices are. So just back to that. So this does not function with the Getty CU. The Getty CU is ignoring this. So for maps, you have this. And then for traction control modes, you have this. We could also pre-program a certain level of traction control in either map, or if you wanted, you could go with this as well. So lots of, lots of ways to configure that. Up here, we've got the Mako 360. This is the bar damping system. Uh, you can study this out. We'll, we have a video series coming up where we have a, a vibration engineer that we're going to be working with to do some data analysis of the damping systems. We've had the Robert Hermosi system on here, which I like very much, and I like the Mako 360 very much. I like both of those uh, probably equally at this point, just, just with basic ride testing. The only reason I, I went with the Mako on this ride is because I needed a stabilizer uh, for the fast open desert riding that we were doing, and we don't have a, a, a block for the Hermosi setup just yet. We're going to be working out a solution for that to add that. So in the interim, I just threw back on the Mako, and I really like it a lot. And then so you can see that setup there. Uh, running stuck bars for now. I will probably swap those out to uh, Pro Taper later and then i like the od row grips that's our turn signal switch there and over here is the motor minded bomber switch all of that everything on this bar setup is my premium first choice on all my bikes uh, and then we talked about the reflex and the reason i like the reflex is because there is a there's a little steel baited cable right here which connects the bracket to the bar guard system and then that allows for bar flex it also means that no matter what bar bend you have no matter what sweep or configuration this thing means you don't have to bend your guards to made up and to match everything and if you've ever been frustrated where you have a bar bend that isn't isn't really super compatible with your bar guards then you're customizing yourself and so i avoid all that it takes care of all those hassles with that so oh double take mirror and then we've got a uh, rugged radio. That's a push to talk for the, for the uh, UHF VHF radio system that we run. So that's probably it for now. If you see that I missed anything, let me know in the comments or if you have any questions about the long-term testing on this 450, uh, you can please leave those in the comments. STR on the air bleeders there, I just saw that. And then maybe the last thing I'll mention is weight. So this bike, I just have it on the scale here. This is a packing scale and it's turned off, but it was 275 with a full tank of gas. So with 3.1 gallons of gas, wet, ready to go. And that was with the seat on. So ready to ride 275. I am happy with that, super happy with that. And that's with quite a bit of these guards and accessories on there. Uh, it's obviously heavier than stock, but I am, again, I'm very happy with the weight. I'm very happy with how it's turned out. And this bike is Baja ready. Uh, this next weekend, we're gonna be heading out with Simon Cudby to Octeo Wells to do some riding and photography and more testing. I'll have the Yoshi on there for that ride. And that'll be the first time I've had it on with this bike and I'm stoked to see how that's gonna turn out. So thanks, thanks for checking out our channel. If you need anything from us, you can always shoot us an email or a call. We're happy to help you out with your bike in any way that we can. Share the stoke and share the experience with you whenever possible. 
like and subscribe go out get some adventure